Section Two of The Mad Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The day went on. Once Burl saw upon the blue green mold that spread upward from the river a band of large red Amazon ants marching in orderly array to raid the city of a colony of black ants and carry away the eggs they would find there. The eggs would be hatched, and the small black creatures made the slaves of the brigands who had stolen them. The Amazon ants can live only by the labor of their slaves, and for that reason are mighty warriors in their world. Later, etched against the streaming mist that overhung everything as far as the eye could reach, Burl saw strangely shaped, swollen branches rearing themselves from the ground. He knew what they were. A hard-rinded fungus that grew upon itself in peculiar mockery of the vegetation that had vanished from the earth. And again he saw pear-shaped objects above, some of which floated little clouds of smoke. They, too, were fungus growths, puffballs which, when touched, emit what seems a puff of vapor. These would have towered above Burl's head had he stood beside them. And then, as the day drew to an end, he saw in the distance what seemed a range of purple hills. They were tall hills to Burl, some sixty or seventy feet high, and they seemed to be the agglomeration of a formless growth, multiplying its organisms and forms upon itself until the hole formed an irregular, cone-shaped mound. Burl watched them apathetically. Presently he ate again of the oily fish. The taste was pleasant to him, accustomed to feed mostly upon insipid mushrooms. He stuffed himself, though the size of his prey left by far the larger part uneaten. He still held his spear firmly beside him. It had brought him into trouble, but Burl possessed a fund of obstinacy. Unlike most of his tribe, he associated the spear with the food it had secured, rather than the difficulty into which it had led him. When he had eaten his fill, he picked it up and examined it again. The sharpness of its point was unimpaired. Burl handled it meditatively debating whether or not to attempt to fish again. The shakiness of his little raft dissuaded him, and he abandoned the idea. Presently he stripped a sinew from the garment about his middle and hung the fish about his neck with it. That would leave him both hands free. Then he sat cross-legged upon the soggily floating fungus, like a pink-skinned Buddha, and watched the shores go by. Time had passed, and it was drawing near sunset. Burl, never having seen the sun save as a bright spot in the overhanging haze, did not think of the coming of night as sunset. To him it was the letting down of darkness from the sky. Today happened to be an exceptionally bright day, and the haze was not as thick as usual. Far to the west the thick mist turned to gold while the thicker clouds above became blurred masses of dull red. Their shadows seemed like lavender, from the contrast of shades. Upon the still surface of the river, all the myriad tints and shadings were reflected with an incredible faithfulness, and the shining tops of the giant mushrooms by the river brim glowed faintly pink. Dragonflies buzzed over his head in their swift and angular flight, the metallic luster of their bodies glistening in the rosy light. Great yellow butterflies flew lightly above the stream. Here, there, and everywhere upon the water appeared the shell-formed boats of a thousand caddisflies floating upon the surface while they might. Burl could have thrust his hand down into their cavities and seized the white worms that inhabited the strange craft. The huge bulk of a tardy bee droned heavily overhead. Burl glanced upward and saw the long proboscis and the hairy hinder legs 
with their scanty load of pollen. He saw the great, multiple-lensed eyes with their expression of stupid preoccupation, and even the sting that would mean death alike for him and for the giant insect, should it be used. The crimson radiance grew dim at the edge of the world. The purple hills had long been left behind. Now the slender stalks of ten thousand round-domed mushrooms lined the river bank, and beneath them spread fungi of all colors, from the rawest red to palest blue, but all now fading slowly to a monochromatic background in the growing dusk. The buzzing, fluttering, and the flapping of the insects of the day died slowly down, while from a million hiding places there crept out into the deep night soft and furry bodies of great moths who preened themselves and smoothed their feathery antenna before taking to the air. The strong-limbed crickets set up their thunderous noise, grown gravely bass with the increasing size of the organs by which the sound was made, and then there began to gather on the water those slender spirals of tenuous mist that would presently blanket the stream in a mantle of thin fog. Night fell. The clouds above seemed to lower and grow dark. Gradually, now a drop and then a drop, now a drop and then a drop, the languid fall of large, warm raindrops that would drip from the moisture-laden skies all through the night began. The edge of the stream became a place where great disks of coolly glowing flame appeared. The mushrooms that bordered on the river were faintly phosphorescent, Pleurotus phosphorius, and shone coldly upon the rusts and flake fungi beneath their feet. Here and there a ball of lambent flame appeared, drifting idly above the steaming, festering earth. Thirty thousand years before, men had called them will-o'-the-wisps, but Burl simply stared at them, accepting them as he accepted all that passed. Only a man attempting to advance in the scale of civilization tries to explain everything that he sees. The savage and the child is most often content to observe without comment, unless he repeats the legends told him by wise folk who are possessed by the itch of knowledge. Burl watched for a long time. Great fireflies, whose beacons lighted up their surroundings for many yards, fireflies Burl knew to be as long as his spear, shed their intermittent glows upon the stream. Softly fluttering wings, in great beats that poured torrents of air upon him, passed above Burl. The air was full of winged creatures. The night was broken by their cries, by the sound of their invisible wings, by their cries of anguish and their mating calls. Above him and on all sides the persistent, intense life of the insect world went on ceaselessly, but Burl rocked back and forth upon his frail mushroom boat and wished to weep because he was being carried from his tribe and from Saya. Saya of the swift feet and white teeth, of the shy smile. Burl may have been homesick, but his principal thoughts were of Saya. He had dared greatly to bring a gift of fresh meat to her, meat captured as meat had never been known to be taken by a member of the tribe. And now he was being carried from her. He lay disconsolate, upon his floating atom on the water for a great part of the night. It was long after midnight when the mushroom raft struck gently and remained grounded upon a shallow in the stream. When the light came in the morning, Burl gazed about him keenly. He was some twenty yards from the shore, and the greenish scum surrounded his now disintegrated vessel. The river had widened out until the other bank was barely to be seen through the haze above the surface of the river, but the nearer shore seemed firm and no more full of dangers than the territory his tribe inhabited. He felt the depth of the water with his spear 
then was struck with the multiple usefulness of that weapon. The water would come to but slightly above his ankles. Shivering a little with fear, Burl stepped down into the water, then made for the bank at the top of his speed. He felt a soft something clinging to one of his bare feet. With an access of terror, he ran faster and stumbled upon the shore in a panic. He stared down at his foot. A shapeless, flesh-colored pad clung to his heel, and as Burl watched, it began to swell slowly, while the pink of its wrinkled folds deepened. It was no more than a leech, sharing in the enlargement nearly all the lower world had undergone, but Burl did not know that. He thrust at it with the side of his spear, then scraped frantically at it, and it fell off, leaving a blotch of blood upon the skin where it came away. It lay, writhing and pulsating, upon the ground, and Burl fled from it. He found himself in one of the toadstool forests with which he was familiar, and finally paused disconsolately. He knew the nature of the fungus growths about him, and presently fell to eating. In Burl the sight of food always produced hunger, a wise provision of nature to make up for the instinct to store food, which he lacked. Burl's heart was small within him. He was far from his tribe, and far from Saya. In the parlance of this day it is probably that no more than forty miles separated them, but Burl did not think of distances. He had come down the river. He was in a land he had never known or seen. And he was alone. All about him was food. All the mushrooms that surrounded him were edible and formed a store of sustenance Burl's whole tribe could not have eaten in many days. But that very fact brought Saya to his mind more forcibly. He squatted on the ground wolfing down the insipid mushroom in great gulps, when an idea suddenly came to him with all the force of inspiration. He would bring Saya here, where there was food, food in great quantities, and she would be pleased. Burl had forgotten the large and oily fish that still hung down his back from the sinew about his neck, but now he rose, and its flapping against him reminded him again. He took it and fingered it all over, getting his hands and himself thoroughly greasy in the process, but he could eat no more. The thought of Saya's pleasure at the sight of that, too, reinforced his determination. With all the immediacy of a child or a savage, he set off at once. He had come along the bank of the stream. He would retrace his steps along the bank of the stream. Through the awkward aisles of the mushroom forest he made his way, eyes and ears open for possibilities of danger. Several times he heard the omnipresent clicking of ants on their multifarious businesses in the wood, but he could afford to ignore them. They were short-sighted at best, and at worst they were foragers rather than hunters. He only feared one kind of ant, the army ant, which sometimes travels in hordes of millions, eating all that it comes upon. In ages past, when they were tiny creatures not an inch long, even the largest animals fled from them. Now that they measured a foot in length, not even the gorged spiders whose distended bellies were a yard in thickness dared offer them battle. The mushroom forest came to an end, a cheerful grasshopper, a figure, munched delicately at some dainty it had found. Its hind legs were bunched beneath it in perpetual readiness for flight. A monster wasp appeared above, as long as Burl himself, poised an instant, dropped, and seized the luckless feaster. There was a struggle, then the grasshopper became helpless and the wasp's flexible abdomen curved delicately. Its sting entered the jointed armor of its prey, just beneath the head. 
the sting entered with all the deliberate precision of a surgeon's scalpel, and all struggle ceased. The wasp grasped the paralyzed, not dead, insect and flew away. Burl grunted and passed on. He had hidden when the wasp darted down from above. The ground grew rough, and Burl's progress became painful. He clambered arduously up steep slopes and made his way cautiously down their farther sides. Once he had to climb through a tangled mass of mushrooms, so closely placed and so small that he had to break them apart with blows of his spear before he could pass, when they shed upon him torrents of a fiery red liquid that rolled off his greasy breast and sank into the ground. Lactarius Deliciosus A strange self-confidence now took possession of Burl. He walked less cautiously and more boldly. The mere fact that he had struck something and destroyed it provided him with a curious, fictitious courage. He had climbed slowly to the top of a red clay cliff, perhaps a hundred feet high, slowly eaten away by the river when it overflowed. Burl could see the river. At some past flood time it had lapped at the base of the cliff on whose edge he walked, though now it came no nearer than a quarter mile. The cliffside was almost covered with shelf fungi, large and small, white, yellow, orange, and green, in indescribable confusion and luxuriance. From a point halfway up the cliff, the inch-like cable of a spider's web stretched down to an anchorage on the ground, and the strangely geometrical pattern of the web glistened evilly. Somewhere among the fungi of the cliffside, the huge creature waited until some unfortunate prey should struggle helplessly in its monster snare. The spider waited in a motionless, implacable patience, invincibly certain of prey, utterly merciless to its victims. Burl strutted on the edge of the cliff, a silly little pink-skinned creature with an oily fish slung about his neck and a draggled fragment of a moth's wing about his middle. In his hand he bore the long spear of a minotaur beetle. He strutted and looked scornfully down upon the whitely shining trap below him. He struck mushrooms, and they had fallen before him. He feared nothing. He strode fearlessly along. He would go to Saya and bring her to this land where food grew in abundance. Sixty paces before him, a shaft sank vertically in the sandy, clayey soil. It was a carefully rounded shaft and lined with silk. It went down for perhaps thirty feet or more, and there enlarged itself into a chamber where the owner and digger of the shaft might rest. The top of the hole was closed by a trap door, stained with mud and earth to imitate with precision the surrounding soil. A keen eye would have been needed to perceive the opening. But a keen eye now peered out from a tiny crack, the eye of the engineer of the underground dwelling. Eight hairy legs surrounded the body of the creature that hung motionless at the top of the silk-lined shaft. A huge, misshapen globe formed its body, colored a dirty brown. Two pairs of ferocious mandibles stretched before its fierce mouth parts. Two eyes glittered evilly in the darkness of the burrow. And over the whole body spread a rough, mangy fur. It was a thing of implacable malignance, of incredible ferocity. It was the brown hunting spider, the American tarantula, Miguel Hensii. Its body was two feet and more in diameter, and its legs, outstretched, would cover a circle three yards across. It watched Burl, its eyes glistening. Slaver welled up and dropped from its jaws. And Burl strutted forward on the edge of the cliff, puffed up with a sense of his own importance. 
the white snare of the spinning spider below him impressed him as amusing. He knew the spider would not leave its web to attack him. He reached down and broke off a bit of fungus growing at his feet. Where he broke it, it was oozing a soupy liquid and was full of tiny maggots in a delirium of feasting. Burl flung it down into the web and then laughed as the black bulk of the hidden spider swung down from its hiding place to investigate. The tarantula, peering from its burrow, quivered with impatience. Burl drew near and nearer. He was using his spear as a lever now and prying off bits of fungus to fall down the cliffside into the colossal web. The spider below went leisurely from one place to another, investigating each new missile with its palpi, then leaving them, as they appeared lifeless and undesirable prey. Burl laughed again as a particularly large lump of shelf fungus narrowly missed the black and silver figure below. Then the trapdoor fell into place with a faint click, and Burl whirled about. His laughter turned to a scream. Moving toward him with incredible rapidity, the monster tarantula opened its dripping jaws. Its mandibles gaped wide. The poison fangs were unsheathed. The creature was thirty paces away, twenty paces, ten. It leaped into the air, eyes glittering, all its eight legs extended to seize, fangs bared. Burl screamed again and thrust out his arms to ward off the impact of the leap. In his terror, his grasp upon his spear had become agonized. The spear point shot out and the tarantula fell upon it. Nearly a quarter of the spear entered the body of the ferocious thing. It struck upon the spear, writhing horribly, still struggling to reach Burl, who was transfixed with horror. The mandibles clashed, strange sounds came from the beast. Then one of the attenuated hairy legs rasped across Burl's forearm. He gasped in ultimate fear and stepped backward, and the edge of the cliff gave way beneath him. He hurtled downward, still clutching the spear which led the writhing creature from him. Down through space, eyes glassy with panic, the two creatures, the man and the giant tarantula, fell together. There was a strangely elastic crash and crackling. They had fallen into the web beneath them. Burl had reached the end of terror. He could be no more fear-struck. Struggling madly in the gummy coils of an immense web, which ever bound him more tightly, with a wounded creature shuddering in agony not a yard from him, Yet a wounded creature that still strove to reach him with its poison fangs, Burl had reached the limit of panic. He fought like a madman to break the coils about him. His arms and breast were greasy from the oily fish, and the sticky web did not adhere to them, but his legs and body were inextricably fastened by the elastic threads spread for just such prey as he. He paused a moment in exhaustion. Then he saw, five yards away, the silvery and black monster waiting patiently for him to weary himself. It judged the moment propitious. The tarantula and the man were one in its eyes, one struggling thing that had fallen opportunely into its snare. They were moving but feebly now. The spider advanced delicately, swinging its huge bulk nimbly along the web paying out a cable after it came inexorably toward him. Burl's arms were free because of the greasy coating they had received. He waved them wildly, shrieking at the pitiless monster that approached. The spider paused. Those moving arms suggested mandibles that might wound or slap. Spiders take few hazards. This spider was no exception to the rule. It drew cautiously near, then stopped. Its spinnerets became busy, 
and with one of its six legs, used like an arm, it flung a sheet of gummy silk impartially over both the tarantula and the man. Burl fought against the descending shroud. He strove to thrust it away, but in vain. In a matter of minutes he was completely covered in a silken cloth that hid even the light from his eyes. He and his enemy, the giant tarantula, were beneath the same covering, though the tarantula moved but weakly. The shower ceased. The web spider had decided that they were helpless. Then Burl felt the cables of the web give slightly as the spider approached to sting and suck the sweet juices from its prey. The web yielded gently as the added weight of the black-bellied spider approached. Burl froze into stillness under his enveloping covering. Beneath the same silken shroud, the tarantula writhed in agony upon the point of Burl's spear. It clashed its jaws, shuddering upon the horny barb. Burl was quiet in an ecstasy of terror. He waited for the poison fangs to be thrust into him. He knew the process. He had seen the leisurely fashion in which the giant spiders delicately stung their prey then withdrew to wait without impatience for the poison to do its work. When their victim had ceased to struggle, they drew near again and sucked the sweet juices from the body, first from one point and then another, until what had so recently been a creature vibrant with life became a shrunken, withered husk to be flung from the web at nightfall. Most spiders are tidy housekeepers, destroying their snares daily to spin anew. The bloated, evil creature moved meditatively about the shining sheet of silk it had cast over the man and the giant tarantula when they fell from the cliff above. Now only the tarantula moved feebly. Its body was outlined by a bulge in the concealing shroud, throbbing faintly as it still struggled with the spear in its vitals. The irregularly rounded protuberance offered a point of attack for the web spider. It moved quickly forward and stung. Galvanized into fresh torment by this new agony, the tarantula writhed in a very hell of pain. Its legs, clustered about the spear still fastened into its body, struck out purposelessly in horrible gestures of delirious suffering. Burl screamed as one of them touched him and struggled himself. His arms and head were free beneath the silken sheet because of the grease and oil that coated them. He clutched at the threads about him and strove to draw himself away from his deadly neighbor. The threads did not break, but they parted one from another, and a tiny opening appeared. One of the tarantula's attenuated limbs touched him again. With the strength of utter panic, he hauled himself away, and the opening enlarged. Another struggle, and Burl's head emerged into the open air, and he stared down for twenty feet upon an open space almost carpeted with the chitinous remains of his present captor's former victims. Burl's head was free, and his breast and arms. The fish slung over his shoulder had shed its oil upon him impartially. But the lower part of his body was held firm by the gummy snare of the web spider, a snare far more tenacious than any bird lime ever manufactured by man. He hung in his tiny window for a moment, despairing. Then he saw, at a little distance, the bulk of the monster spider, waiting patiently for its poison to take effect and the struggling of its prey to be stilled. The tarantula was no more than shuddering now. Soon it would be still, and the black-bellied creature waiting on the web would approach for its meal. Burl withdrew his head and thrust desperately at the sticky stuff about his loins and legs. The oil upon his hands kept it from clinging to them, and it gave a little. In a flash of inspiration, Burl understood. He reached over his shoulder and grasped the greasy fish, 
tore it in a dozen places, and smeared himself with the now rancid exudation, pushing the sticky threads from his limbs and oiling the surface from which he had thrust it away. He felt the web tremble. To the spider its poison seemed to have failed of effect. Another sting seemed to be necessary. This time it would not insert its fangs into the quiescent tarantula, but would sting where the disturbance was manifest, would send its deadly venom into burl. He gasped and drew himself toward his window. It was as if he would have pulled his legs from his body. His head emerged, his shoulders. Half his body was out of the hole. The colossal spider surveyed him and made ready to cast more of its silken sheet upon him. The spinnerets became active, and the sticky stuff about Burl's feet gave way. He shot out of the opening and fell sprawling, awkwardly and heavily, upon the earth below, crashing upon the shrunken shell of a flying beetle which had fallen into the snare and had not escaped. Burl rolled over and over and then sat up. An angry, foot-long ant stood before him, its mandibles extended threateningly, while its antenna waved wildly in the air. A shrill stridulation filled the air. In ages past, when ants were tiny creatures of lengths to be measured in fractions of an inch, learned scientists debated gravely if their tribe possessed a cry. They believed that certain grooves upon the body of the insects, after the fashion of those upon the great legs of the cricket, might offer the means of uttering an infinitely high-pitched sound too shrill for man's ear to catch. Burl knew that the stridulation was caused by the doubtful insect before him, though he had never wondered how it was produced. The cry was used to summon others of its city, to help it in its difficulty or good fortune. Clicking sounded fifty or sixty feet away. Comrades were coming to aid the pioneer. Harmless save when interfered with, all save the army ant, that is, the whole ant tribe was formidable when aroused. Utterly fearless, they could pull down a man and slay him, as so many infuriated fox terriers might have done thirty thousand years before. End of section two. Recording by Roger Moline.